It's a real honor to uh, introduce uh, Jean-Louis Cohen, who actually, for those of you who have been at the, at the discussion, uh, has already been introduced, of course, from his, his comments, and you know that with, uh, with people we curated, uh, co-curated the um, exhibition at, at Maxi in, in Rome. Jean-Louis is a long-standing friend of the GSD. He's actually uh, been very, very important for the GSD. Um, and I consider, we consider him a friend, but the fact is he's the premier scholar of modern architecture in, in, in the world, right? So it's also good to have friends like that. <laughs> well, he's, uh, well, and Tony Vidler, Tony, Tony's agreeing. <laughs> for, 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 we have a hit parade here. There are a couple of reasons. There, there's a sort of ordinary reasons like publishing. Jean-Louis has published more than 30 books. It's actually hard to keep track. Um, I just want to mention a couple. One, because it's a recent translation into English, the uh, France Modern Architecture in History, uh, translated by Christian Hubert. Um, it's like 400 pages of, of, of French culture and French architecture. Um, n n not a sort of greatest hits, not an author, you know, not the great auteurs only, but of significant architecture uh, far beyond Corbusier, f which he is also a, um, published widely on. Um, I'm, I'm going to use the punchline that he that Jean-Louis himself used once when he visited here about his scholarship on Corbusier, that he has published both the smallest book uh, and the largest. The, the Toshin, uh, the part of that series, is a very small canonic book that's used as a textbook. But the one that he co-edited or co-published with uh, Tim Benton is called Le Grand, um, which I like very much the English would just be the big, right? <laughs> right. The, but I like, I like, no, that's better. But I like the big more than the grand, right? Um, it, and so it's the smallest book, and this is, of course, the largest book. And Jean Louis said it, he's insisting it's not a coffee table book. In fact, with four legs, it is the table. So, <laughs> so, um, um, but, but. But in a way, the, the, for a premier scholar, the, that's, these are ordinary. These are important and, and impressive, but ordinary to publish. The thing that uh, is most impressive about Jean-Louis is, I would say, an almost unmatched intellectual generosity. He uh, was, has been on our visiting committee. He was on our visiting committee for many years. He was instrumental in not, not just the formation of our PhD program, but its actual design and construction and continued to be an advisor over the years about improving our PhD program, which is very important. As, and and he, as an educator and as a pedagogue, he has, he's been mentor to generations of students all, o all over the world. And, um, um, and it's just that generosity, I think, that um, is, is, in a, is in a way the more, the more impressive part. And it's an honor to welcome Jean-Louis to the GSD again. Well, it's always great to hear your funeral oration while you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to continue with this pixelated first image, our conversation of Bruno Zevi, and I want to thank uh, everyone at the JSD, beginning with uh, Mosen and Michael, for having uh, accepted the, my pitch of doing something for an illustrious alumnus who uh, was, didn't get an M-Arch in 42 because there was no M-Arch. Got, he got a bachelor, but he later, later he was given a sort of honorary or, or symbolic on M-Arch in the early 1960s. So many thanks to you, to Paige and your staff for hosting this event. Many thanks for all those who have um, contributed to the discussion so far. Uh, as the uh, emotion generated in Italy by the exhibition, the Architetti di Zevi, Zevi's Architects, held this year at Maxi in Rome as shown, an exhibition which came out of a stupid idea 
I had one day, three years ago, of asking Bruno Zevi to be a, a guest curator at MoMA and to select architects and uh, express his thoughts about them. So this was the initial idea. And then people transformed it into, with my distant uh, help, into uh, a real show. So from what we've seen with this show, Zevi still has a constituency in Italy, maybe in Europe. This, afternoon, this afternoon's conversation confirms that uh, through his writings and more broadly his uh, uh, very broad engagement, he also has a meaning kept or is taking a meaning in North America. Zevi is a citizen of the world, not meaning precisely that he's a wandering Jew, but probably there is something of that type. His trajectory has taken him in a few years from Rome to uh, his hometown, which he left in 1939 to escape uh, Mussolini's racial laws to London, New York, Cambridge, back to Rome in 1944. Later, while based in Rome, he commuted to Venice, but also to Latin America, where his teachings have been uh, decisive, as Pancho has shown, before settling most solidly in the Eternal City, in a sort of fortress on Via Nomentana. Um, here I need to uh, clarify my position in respect to Zevi. Um, uh, Zevi's second book, Architectural Space, or to look at architecture in the English version, has been a defining reading for me, as, I was one of the f as it was one of the f very few books available to architectural students in, late in the late 60s in Paris. The other one would be Gideon's Space, Time and Architecture, translated in 68. Otherwise, it was really a, a desert. As I came closer to Manfredo Tafuri, um, the, um, in the following years, I distanced myself from Zevi's later writings. I met in particular with great skepticism his modern language of architecture published in 1973, which I find a very weird book. Uh, and from then on, uh, I've monitored his positions from, uh, from a certain distance. Yet, as I was getting more and more engaged in historical research, especially when I made a few years ago uh, an attempt to write myself a comprehensive narrative on the developments that have taken place since the late 19th century, the grandeur of Zevi came back to haunt me. Out of a conversation with Bruno's daughter, Ada Chiara, in the fall of 2015 came both the idea of organizing the exhibition and uh, um, and uh, of organizing a conference devoted to his work as a historian, which we are holding today. Uh, let me get back to some stages in which has, have been considered uh, in uh, uh, various ways uh, today. Let's go back to uh, Zevi's uh, training and, and intellectual origin. Uh, Zevi was trained at the Facoltà di Architettura, the newly created faculties of one of the newly created faculties of architecture uh, in Italy, in Rome, which was then under the hegemony of Marcello Piacentini, uh, an eclectic uh, architect who gave uh, space to modernism in his discourse, a more conservative character like uh, Gustavo Giovannoni, who was decisively anti-modern. But there were other inputs that came uh, to, uh, that filtered through the faculty. The, uh, for instance, the work done by a series of historians and architects around the figure of uh, Sant'Elia, who was becoming a sort of a fascist saint and modern his saint uh, in the mid-30s, and uh, Davy read uh, Dopo Sant'Elia. Uh, Echoes of what, had ha what was happening in North America also reached Italy. Lionel Venturi, who was one of uh, Zevi's mentors, signaled to him the uh, exhibition of MoMA of 1932. And Zevi later, later affirmed that he had gotten the catalog in the mid-30s, which has been proved by uh, Robert Duglio, who was supposed to join us today, and who has the best knowledge of the early life of Zevi to be a complete lie, uh, as he found out that he had received the book in the 
early 60s and not in the mid 30s. So uh, Zevi is a great storyteller, including about himself. Now this is something we'll probably find out again. Uh, what were the, um, what were the, uh, uh, Zevi was engaged in early, very early in his life in intellectual life. And this is important, Zevi was a writer before becoming a, has, a historian. He published his first article in the um, uh, periodical Anno Dodici, year 12 of the fascist regime, in 1933 when he was 15. And he took part to the, to the elite uh, intellectual competitions between uh, uh, secondary uh, school students, as he was at the Liceo Tasso in Rome. Here we see him with Baricata Alatri uh, in Naples, two uh, friends who uh, were to become very important uh, resistant leaders, in particular Al Al uh, Alicata uh, in the Communist Party. Uh, he's Readings were very important, and his role models among uh, historians and intellectuals were to shape his life. Benedetto Croce, the Neapolitan philosopher, whom he read very much and who uh, shaped his view, his man way of looking at, uh, at creators, artists, and architects. Lionello Venturi, uh, whom he, he saw much when he was when they were both in exile in New York. Another um, at, uh, uh, of his teacher in Rome was. Vin Vincenzo Fasolo, uh, oh, Fasolo, Fasolo, Fasolo. Uh, sorry uh, for the accent. Uh, Fasolo was important because Fasolo was teaching um, a history of art and architecture based on the concept of space taken from German Kunstwissenschaft. And I think that it's very important to realize here that Zevi didn't take his, uh, did, didn't build his interest for space out of Frank Wright Wright's uh, uh, discourse or anything else, but out of uh, German science, which is rather amusing when one reads what he would later say from uh, about Tafuri. I will mention this later. So, for instance, Fasolo uh, uh, used as a base for his um, courses Brinkmann's, uh, Albert Erich Brinkmann's book, Plastik und Raum als Grundformen künstlerischer Gestaltung. The, uh, plastic uh, uh, and uh, space as as basic uh, forms of um, uh, artistic form giving, published in 1922. Uh, and Zevi started, uh, and the third character here is uh, Nicolas Pesner. Uh, uh, in the summer of 1939, uh, Bruno Zevi uh, went to London and started uh, studying for a little while at the Architectural Association. Uh, Dulio makes a very good point. He says that among the role models of Zevi at that time were people like Pevsner, who was writing in the Architectural Review his, uh, history uh, articles, or John Summerson, who was writing in the Architects and Building News. So he says that Pevsner, the problem was, was less the positions of Pevsner, Pevsner which uh, Zevi would later um, uh, attack or confront, than his role as a historian who was also present in the professional press. Um, uh, Zevi's first uh, papers while at schools were on uh, Byzantine mosaics, and a very important one was a uh, paper um, entitled Notes uh, for a Biography of Filippo Brunelleschi. And I want to say one thing about this piece, I won't discuss it here today, uh, but uh, it's important to see that uh, from this moment onwards, Zevi has always lionized, heroicized the architects. So his work can be read, and this is how, in the end, his uh, history of modern architectural work can be seen as a celebration of the architects more than, uh, uh, more than sometimes a celebration of architecture. And the story continues here in this, well, not in this building, but on this campus, uh, when Zevi studies uh, from late 1940 to 1942, after a little passage at Columbia University. Uh, here, the school is led by Dean Hudnut, the program by Chair uh, Walter Gropius. 
Um, uh, we know a little bit, Dulio has done the homework about what David did here. In particular, we know this project, which is definitely informed by uh, Breuer, probably more than by Gropius, a sort of inflated uh, uh, house in Lincoln, which would have become a sort of public building. So Zevi, uh, Zevi designs and gets, gets uh, his BA, his BARC. At the same time, he's part, as uh, it has been said before, the group writing to Hadnut this opinion on architecture in 1941. Uh, a very, as Tony has said, a very socially oriented um, uh, pamphlet. Uh, in which the, uh, opposition is voiced about, for instance, the art for art's sake of the abstract maquette, of the abstract model. So against, against not against this, but against the Bauhaus-inspired uh, basic, de uh, basic design. Uh, the authors affirm our purpose is to change the mild course of modern fashion architecture into a struggle for revolution in the architectural world. So very strong word. They pay homage to the early fathers of modern architecture, the pioneers such as Wright, but do not, do not criticize, as Zevi would let later contend explicitly, um, uh, Gropius, if they discuss, uh, uh, if, they, if they criticize the uh, exclusion of history from the program. In fact, they have a rather broad, non-personalized agenda. They wonder, uh, quote, is modern architecture a matter of personal preference or a matter of historical necessity? Uh, End quote. Their main request being the creation of an architectural review at the school, which will become task, uh, published uh, during seven years here. Uh, some issues are uh, displayed in the library. Uh, yet, despite this activity at the school, the main, main uh, work of TV during those years was the publication of these Italian notebooks of the uh, movements Justizia e Libertà, which had come out from the Partito d'Azione, and um, he was the editor of his journal. He also uh, also uh, participated to the uh, radio, radio programs oriented towards uh, Italy. So in a way, he was m probably more into politics than into uh, architectural uh, study. Uh, our Italian colleagues, and let me return to history, uh, like to use the term la fabbrica della storia. Rather than translating it as the factory of a production of history, I would suggest to use a textile metaphor and rather speak of the fabric of history, of a history made of, of a warp and a weft in which many threads are interwoven. In the case of Zevi, among many laws of architectural practice, of politics, of theory, and of public discourse. And this is nowhere clearer than in this amazing little book he published in 1977, Zevi Su Zevi, or Zevi on Zevi, which could be also uh, translated as Zevi above Zevi, hence my title, Zevi under Zevi. So widely illustrators, uh, illustrated as to resemble one of those photo novel magazines invented in Italy in the post-war period, the book documented the most important encounters in Zevi's training as well as his many struggles. Through the pages of a photographic album where near and distant relatives, friends and colleagues cultural and political interlocutors also appear. The subtitle, Architettura come profezia, Architecture as Prophecy, was a play on the words of a seminal text. Here we see Zevi um, in uh, his early days when he was a radio speaker and was returning to, to Italy. Uh, his uh, subtitle was a play on the words of a seminal text written by the anti-fascist critic Eduardo Persico in 1935, whose meaning was overturned to construct the chronicles of almost 40 years of untiring commitment, indeed that of a prophet. And here I, I would say that if we try to to build bridges between bridges or uh, connections between Zevi and um, and uh, Judaism. Uh, it is very clear that uh, Zevi has always had a messianic uh, touch, which 
was is also present in this uh, self-celebration. The, the vehemence of Davy's affirmations makes me inevitably think to that of the Parisian architect Anatole Kopp, who um, was also Jewish, and for, who for his part has uh, doggedly for decades wanted to demonstrate that the modern was a cause and not a style. So I risk a little parallel here. This is something I've developed in the Maxi catalog between these two rather young uh, Jewish architects who are uh, both politically oriented, uh, Kopp was more to the left of Zevi, and who are fighting for uh, history which is not, not understood as an academic practice. So this is Kopp, who had studied at MIT and uh, who was an instructor at Black Mountain College before joining the US Army and landing uh, in Normandy. Uh, the parallel, uh, this parallel between Zevi and Kopp may appear to be forced, and yet it has nothing artificial about it. So both were threatened respectively by the racial laws of Mussolini and Pétain. They spent the war years in the US, in schools run according to the Bauhaus model, uh, Zevi at Harvard and Kopp at Black Mountain College. Upon, upon their return to Europe in 1944 with the US Army, they were both enrolled in the propaganda service to disseminate American construction techniques. Uh, Cobb was the main uh, assistant of Paul Nelson, uh, an American architect who had studied with Auguste Perret and spent the war in the US in this amazing exhibition at the Grand Palais in Paris, American, uh, which uh, depicts, you see the, 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 the poster on the right, a sort of uh, cargo cult, a boat coming from America and bringing prefab houses to uh, uh, devastated Europe. Uh, Cop was an assistant to Paul Nelson, and the show was organized by people like Frederick Gottheim and Louis Kahn, who uh, um, made great part of the design. So it's a very interesting project. A parallel project uh, of a different nature, and uh, um, Ali, Ali, Alifia has, al has already discussed it, is the architect's handbook, here the later edition, but uh, still the same same uh, page with the uh, work by Konrad Waxman. So uh, they were both, uh, uh, and strangely enough for Cobb, who was a communist, uh, agents of influence of America uh, in, um, in this context. Zevi uh, later promoted the work, or started to promote the work of Wright, Van Duisburg, and Mendelssohn, while Cobb kept, al kept alive the memory of Russian constructivism. Uh, there is a, another convergence here, this one most, more closely related to the experience of my generation uh, in, in the cultural wasteland that was 1960s France, at least as, uh, in terms of architecture. Two books stood out then, Cobb's Green Rectangle, Ville et Révolution, and Zévi's White Square. The translation on the right by Lucien Trichot, a popular educator hardly familiar with architecture, had in some way been ratified by the supporters of Le Corbusier. This is quite interesting. Since the book was published in the series entitled Force Vive, directed by Jean Petit, uh, at the time the publisher of all the volumes uh, of Le Corbusier himself. Moreover, uh, the cover, here lost, but this cover, was illustrated with a view of La Tourette. But of course, Zevi's thinking escaped the sophisms of the elderly master. By placing a strong accent on space, the book was of extraordinary relevance in the meager library that Francophone readers had at their disposal in those years. They did not have access, very interestingly, to the founding text of a German Kunstwissenschaft, uh, Wolflin was not translated yet, not before 68, Renaissance and Baroque. Uh, uh, whereas Zevi has read um, uh, almost all these, uh, these writers in, in the text. Um, so we should not be surprised if Zevi was indeed one of the very first interlocutors that the students of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts of Paris engaged before May 68 in a renewal of teaching methods turned to for help. The issue of the magazine Melpomen on the left, published by the students of the Ecole and dedicated to Perret, already began with an epigraph by Zevi. La dictature a horreur de l'histoire car celle-ci 
témoigne. Dictatorship hates history because history bears witness. Uh, a way, <laughs> a, a, a statement which could also be read by, by writing history, I'm continuing the resistance. Um, and it was again the professor on the right who had just been appointed to teach at the University of Rome, whom the students questions in 1965 as to the future of teaching. At first, his words were set against those of the older uh, Ernesto Rogers. Sub subsequently, subsequently, Zevi was flanked by the young assistant Manfredo Tafuri. Uh, Zevi's ideas, and forgive me for this small uh, sort of counterway to the Latin American view of Zevi, uh, which is perhaps a little long. Zevi's ideas were not, however, greeted in France with the brand of unanimous approval, despite their popularity. In Arte Technique, another important volume dedicated to architecture, uh, the art historian Pierre Francastel energetically uh, criticized the thesis of uh, the uh, history of modern architecture by Zevi. He opposed its exclusive focus on North America and above all, what he considered to be excessive vitalism. Um, going back to the 77 photo uh, storybook, Photo Romanzo, Zevi wanted to express himself about, about himself. We have a proposition, in a proposition which uh, varied a little bit from the, part, the initial party of the series, Écrivain de Toujours, to which I refer this book. The, se the first volume in the series in 1951 had been uh, Victor Hugo par lui-même, by himself, which had obviously not been drafted by the author of Les Miserables. There was nothing accidental about such a self-promotion strategy, and it, it actually um, seems to have been part and parcel of a Zevi figure. Anyway, the, the real source is not, of course, Victor Hugo par lui-même, but rather Roland Barthes, by Roland, by Roland Barthes, and I had not planned to, was not expecting Barthes' other uh, drawings as shown by, uh, by Tamar, but I think it's really interesting to see that, what Barthes was imagining for his own book, and uh, uh, clearly knowing the relationship of Zevi to Barthes, it's uh, obviously uh, an attempt to mimic. So it's a sort of Barthesian photo romance, if you want. Uh, um, the, then let's back to, to Zevi's uh, writings. We've all, uh, this is becoming nauseating uh, because we're all discussing the same books, but uh, uh, I'm, I always remember uh, the German, German way of saying in a meeting uh, at the end when everyone is tired, everything has been said, but not by everybody. So, <laughs> so I, will, I will return to that. The publication of uh, History 1950 um, is um, is an exception to the other production of Davy, which we have not discussed uh, today, which is the production of monographs on architects uh, or, or um, urban designers. Um, this, this book can uh, be cl classified in the handbook category as it features both the weight and the elements of such a genre. The format of the Einaudi series could almost make it appear to be a sort of missile. But the introduction is clearly an exercise of reflection, as if it were already a work about Zevi himself, so it's already Zevi on Zevi, since the text is presented as a redevelopment of uh, Verso Architettura Organica, published five years be before. Zevi writes that um, uh, he wrote of the book that, uh, quote, he didn't claim to constitute a history of modern architecture, but limited himself to presenting an interpretation of the development of architectural thinking from the crisis of rationalist to the spread of the organic current, end quote. In retrospect, Zevi measured the limits of his own undertaking. Quote again, rather than going back with a critical eye over a century of architectural history, it was then, in 45, necessary to say clearly what everyone was thinking, and that is that functionalism in its rationalist moment was finished, and along with it, the figurative abstractions that had accompanied it. 
end quote. Zevi's first book thus had all the features of a manifesto, the offspring of a result of a liberation. For the readers of the time, there was no doubt that toward an organic architecture whose thematic and temporal resolutions were clarified by the long subtitle essay on the development of architectural thinking over the past 50 years, parodied the book with which Le Corbusier had made himself known 20 years earlier, Vers une architecture, the book which was not translated into Italian because every um, possible reader knew French at that time, so there, are, there is no other reason in my view. Um, uh, it should be noted, among other things, that the book which was so parodied, would n was judged to be so scandalous at the School of Architecture in Rome that Giovannoni had, had it taken off the shelves of the library. Interestingly. Um, like Le Corbusier, whose book is both a model and an anti-model, Zevi played with a scandal effect, but in the radically different context of liberated Italy, uh, where the texts he was referring to were little known, if at all. What did his readers know about the historical perspective uh, offered by the best-known stories of modern architecture, stories that needed to be rectified, according Zevi, since it was unlikely that those readers had read Platz's, Platz's book in German or Pevsner in English, not to mention the books of uh, Walter Kurt Behrendt or Siegfried Gideon, which they almost certainly did not have within reach. The most accessible book at the time was probably the panoramic synthesis by Sartoris, already widely surpassed by the architectural developments of the 1930s. So to get back to, to, um, to Zevi's book, its merits are many. Uh, one of them is to, well, is, uh, is to really clearly express a point of view about architecture and politics, uh, contrasting the uh, uh, architecture, the innovative architecture that had emerged under fascism on the left, and what the Nazis had produced on the right. Um, uh, he, at the same time, uh, it's very clear that he uh, used this book to uh, introduce... Um, yes, sorry, where was I? Oh, yes, I wanted to show these two, two, two books which uh, were uh, the, really the first, uh, together with Hitchcock's Modern Architecture, Romanticism and Reintegration of uh, 29, which were clearly the books uh, of reference, though hardly uh, available in Italy. Um, yes, I want to say that uh, the introduction of right into the Italian discourse was by no mean uh, uh, an innovation of Zevi. There were many articles about Wright uh, who had been invited, for instance, to have a, a, a little personal show at the Milan Triennale of 1933, where there were uh, 12 such mini uh, exhibitions. So Zevi was not uh, uh, the first one to discuss the work, uh, the work of Wright. Um, Zevi appeared to be indulgent toward him, not mentioning his pacifist commitment in the pre-war period, which has caused, for instance, Mumford to break up with him. And starting from the early years of his American sojourn, Miss, uh, on the other side, had, had also opposed Miss Van der Rohe, with whom, as soon as they had met, according to Zevi, they immediately started talking about politics, ethics, sociology, philosophy, art, and architecture. Uh, a charismatic orator, and we, we've already mentioned this before, Zevi offered his services to national and international tribunes after towards an organic architecture. One of his key texts, which has not been mentioned today, but for me it's a very important one in the Italian context, uh, is um, his Della Cultura Architettonica, um, concerning architectural culture, a report presented in 1949 on behalf of APAO and MSA and the Milanese Modernist at the Siam in Bergamo. The text is a classical oratorical exercise as it is entirely built on the rejection of uh, Siegfried Gideon's thesis. After having come across the traces left by the Zurich historian at Harvard, Zevi now observed his power inside Siam. Uh, 
uh, which saw him as the animating spirit of the conferences. That seductive expression of architectural culture would later become very popular for its all-encompassing and rather vague nature, but it was completely new at the time. Zevi, as always, did <laughs> give no precise definition of his. Uh, there is a term in French which I like very much. It's called the uh, les mots valises, words as suitcases, words which have a large capacity to house all sorts of bizarre things. So this is also a mot valise. Uh, Zevi ventured to say, quote, architecture and architectural culture are identified with each other. If it is not supported by a fertile critical spirit, one that is alive, stimulating, then architecture sinks into mannerism, another bad word, end quote. Culture thus overlaps the activity of ideation, consolidating it from the outside, like the exoskeleton of an invertebrate. In his introduction to the history of modern architecture, the following year, Zevi clarified what he meant by the cultural task of architecture. Uh, quote again, it is a question of maintaining a critical intransigence, a lack of scruples, a non-conformism, or better still, an actuality of judgment that do not make us regret acting outside the English-speaking civilization that shines with ingenious ideas, new perspectives, often fitting and ever free experimentalism, innovative and caustic, but offsets all this with unsystematic thinking that makes it more, much more difficult to build a culture. An architectural culture, in short, that is real, serious, authentic historical culture, but that actually, because of that, is necessary for life. Making use of space, time, and architecture as a sort of punching ball, Zevi dedicated practically all his speech in Bergamo to Gideon in a historical perspective instead of a prospective approach. Um, uh, uh, he, he said in particular, uh, I am afraid that Gideon's historical vision coincides to those of many of Siam's officials, and in particular Le Corbusier. The, la the latter has indeed always sought to convince us that he has inaugurated and discovered modern architecture, instead of being content with being one of its leading personalities, something that everyone enthusiastically acknowledges him to be. Uh, Gideon, Zévi, um, uh, uh, for instance, deplored Gideon's fetishistic obsession with Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie, and a few years before Ernesto Rogers, I think we have here another interesting genealogy, he suggested a historical revision uh, of these works based on some strategic operation. The first of these operations involved the expansion of the canon Gideon was referring to, in particular by including uh, Erich Mendelssohn, um, albeit saying nothing about the other very surprising absence in Gideon's book, The Russians, represented solely by view of Tatin's Tower. Another operation aimed at overturning the diachronic narrative, in truth already carried out in 1945, as he would, would write retrospectively, and this is very one of my favorite statements of Zevi, which was mentioned in passing by people. Quote, when I wrote my first book to what an organic architecture, my reply to those who congratulated me was jokingly, Gideon deserves all the credit, not me. All I did was translate space, time, and architecture with one change. I moved the chapter on right to after the one on Le Corbusier. <laughs> Et voilà, end quote. In this text, Zevi made an effort to reassign the roles on the Mount Olympus of modern architecture, what he called the acme of the whole historical cycle, gathering to together Le Corbusier, Gropius, Smith, and if one wishes, Mendelssohn uh, and Aude. He thus announced a plan that he would subsequently uh, put into practice methodically, using all the resources at his disposal from the most conventional ins instruments that historians have always had since the press was invented, the book and maybe the journal, to all the other ones. Um, once an overall picture had been outlined with this history, Xavier would construct a series of interconnected narratives, weaving uh, the thread uh, of both the chronicles and the criticism along with that of history. In this interwoven fabric, counter-transference, that is the affective adhesion of the architect about 
towards the architects about which he, he wrote led him to choose a limited number of figures deemed to be worthy of his attention on both the Italian and the, and the international scenes. Added to, to the ab above cited names are those of a certain number of Italians, starting from Terrani and other contemporaries, but also a few Americans like uh, Oscar Stonorov, with whom Zevi had worked in 1951 for the Wright exhibition in Florence, and a long time afterwards, figures we've mentioned today, and which I will refer to again, Gary and others. His focus on particular figures was accompanied by sort of encyclopedism of which the history is an example, and uh, which was uh, extended by the vast system of information channeled by his, uh, his periodicals. Uh, before the future animators of Team 10 uh, could find new critical uh, resources in the narratives, where am I in terms of images, yes, um, of, uh, yes, where, where is it, I've lost, sorry, yes, I wanted to stay on the uh, Poetica. Yes. Before the future animators of Team 10 could find new critical resources in the narratives of the social sciences, from anthropology to sociology, in order to oppose the hegemony of the founders of Siam, and before Rogers returned to the neglected paternal figures from Perret to Burns and Loos in Casabella Continuita, Xavier attempted with one last prophetic book to correct the framework put forward by Gideon, Poetica dell'Architettura Neoplastica, mentioned by Tony eloquently, forms a sort of counterpart to the operation conducted around Wright with the Florence exhibition. Zevi instituted a new Olympic triad. In short, Le, Le Corbusier expresses what, right, a vague why, Van Doesburg, the how of the new architecture. Very well said. This book allowed him to also to enroll finally Miss Van der Rohe, whom he had previously ignored and whose uh, fame he had felt was growing ever since 45, but in the Dutch group with the aid of, the aid of a certain rhetorical stump. Stunt. Zevi saw in these projects a rigorous application of the 17 points with which Van Doesburg illustrated his method and went so far as to write, imagine 10 houses by me constructed one right next to the other. That will give you some idea of a neoplastic city. Even before this series of books had been completely published, uh, Zevi's success had already rapidly crossed the Italian borders. Two Words and Organic Architecture was published in London in 1950, while the Spanish-speaking world discovered him thanks to an invitation to Spain and the translation of his book, and many Lat Latin American um, excursions, which gave him even more resonance. Uh, by taking, uh, well, here, I'll get back to this. By taking the power against the, the historical narrative with its speech in Bergamo, and before surrendering the battle in Siam, Zevi took a stand at the anti-Gideon, or as the new Gideon, making use of resolutely prophetic tones. Indeed, indeed, would he not manage a modern-day Moses, this is perhaps again uh, Judaism, who brings the Ten Commandments back from the Sinai to, to give the world the seven invariants? characterized by an equally uh, moralistic perspective. Now, crossing this warp of history, uh, the weft of many other threads could be mentioned today. And I will be very, be, be very quick. This has been mentioned already in various ways this morning. Politics, uh, the APAO, Association for uh, uh, Organic Architecture, very strange organization. It was, architects have been in politics ever since the 19th century, but it was the first time that an architectural organization was presenting candidates at an election. But Zevi was uh, aspiring to be elected in the Municipal Council of Rome. So this is a very important moment in the illusion that an architect, again, the architectural world can have as such a presence on the political scene. Zevi at that time was engaged in the police politics and the policies of reconstruction, then, thanks to his friendship with the historian Carlo Ludovico Raghianti, who uh, was uh, one of the coordinators of Italian reconstruction. He was also engaged in a series of pro projects that failed with Adriano 
Olivetti, a very important relationship which has been discussed extremely interestingly by Marida Talamona in the Maxi catalog. As for his political en engagements, we've seen uh, the uh, Partito d'Azione slash Giustizia Libertà. For many decades, the Socialist Party, uh, he represents the Socialist Party uh, in uh, various, various political uh, assemblies. Then the Radical Party, uh, which was, uh, has been mentioned by people this morning. And at the end, this sort of one-man show, one-man attempt at recreating a party called Partito d'Azione Liberal Socialista, Liberal Socialist Party of Action, founded in 1998 and which died with him two years later. The public sphere, uh, magazines, journals, a first, a first article in 1933, uh, the series of uh, uh, issues of Metron, which he did not lead initially, but, but which he uh, later took control of, uh, L'Architettura, and here we see, I'm returning to the photo roman, so we see Alto and his wife leafing with uh, apparently great uh, a sort of gourmet smile at <laughs> uh, the pages of a journal, the Chronicles in L'Espresso, which lasted for 50 years, I think completely original, but with a model. The model was again an American model. The model for me was uh, Louis Mumford's column in the New Yorker, the skyline, very clearly. Again, the role of Mumford on the Italian scene should not be underestimated. In many ways, he was translated, he was uh, read and copied. Uh, he left L'Espresso because of uh, the uh, people. Scalfari was then the director, because Scalfari supported the Palestinians. So Zevi, and here we are beginning to get closer to the, uh, to the, the Jewish question, um, supported mildly the, the Palest Palestinian rights, not more radical than that. Social. Yeah. Social. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and television, this has been mentioned by people, creating a television uh, channel in the basement of his fortress on the Anomentana and beaming out fantastic programs which were shown at the, at the Maxi show. Uh, the academic scene, uh, Zevi was very active in academic, uh, uh, in academic programs in Italy. It must be said, uh, to give a little bit of context, that these Fa the faculties of architecture had not, for the la largest part, not been purged out of their fascist elements. Uh, Piacentini had a, a little discussion with a sort of very gentle tribunal and was, uh, was let loose. Uh, so no operation in the faculties, which means that the, the, until the 60s, a uh, great part of the teachers in Italy were former fascists. And that's the former order. This must be underlined because we can make fun of uh, Zevi, the um, talkative uh, orator, the agitator, but it must be said that until 19, until Zevi came back to uh, Rome from uh, Venice around uh, 67, 68, there was no chair specially dedicated to uh, modern architecture in Italy. So modern architecture was taught indirectly in a subversive way through other uh, programs. And here the, the, the great merit goes to Albert, to Giuseppe Samona, who was the rector of the school in Venice and who uh, invited uh, Zevi, recruited Zevi, promoted uh, Scarpa uh, and many, many others and made of Zevi a sort of center of architectural culture with both Romans uh, and, and Milanese. Um, so, Camata Roma, Zevi called to Rome, and his resignation mentioned by people this morning. Uh, between, uh, between the academic world and uh, public, the public sphere exhibitions, uh, which have played a very important role. Here, uh, we've discussed this, uh, many times the, um, 
the Mich Michelangelo uh, exhibition of 64. Uh, I want to uh, remind you, this has been briefly said, that models were made by students. So this was clearly a new model for architectural exhibitions. Uh, students not used in order to paint the rooms, but in order to produce interpretive, uh, interpretive systems. This is, I think, very, very important. Um, another, um, sorry. Yes, another exhibition in which Zevi was uh, engaged, although he was not the initial promoter, was the great, great, it can be said great or grand, uh, or, uh, exhibition organized by uh, about right 60 uh, years of living architecture in its Venice version. And this is a very funny little note uh, by Wright. Dear Bruno, so glad you are heading, heading the exhibition. It is the grandest show in architecture. Ever, they say. No exaggeration. I think that if, if Wright would have known Twitter, he, he would have been better than Donald Trump. Um, OK. And then, uh, of course, uh, academic and, 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 and theoretical discussions. The relationship with uh, Tafuri has been discussed. Tafuri was a sort of uh, runaway son for uh, Zevi, who identified very much with him. And uh, but Tafuri uh, beat the hand of Zevi. Uh, again, he uh, challenged, he said that he, one had to end with demystification. One had to demystify demystification. Uh, Tafuri uh, responded in uh, uh, some of his early books by criticizing not only the so-called operative history of uh, Zevi, a uh, history meant to improve practice, but he, most importantly, and this is where he hit Zevi very much, he criticized his way of writing history. Zevi had, has never been in an archive for his entire life. Tafuri was celebrating the archival work, the important document which changed the interpretation. And hence, in a footnote, which in a killer footnote, footnote of the MoMA catalog of uh, 1972, he criticized the, superfic the superficiality of Zevi, who was really hurt. And they, had a, they continued to, to correspond. Well, one amazing thing in uh, those times before email were that people were used to write letters. So even if, uh, as uh, uh, Alicia said, uh, uh, Zevi and, um, and Moretti were very, very opposed politically, they had very long quarters and substantial letters, the same with Tafuri. And uh, uh, very, very amusingly, uh, for Zevi, who had been uh, trained by a uh, sort of uh, Roman version of uh, Kunst, German Kunstwissenschaft, he criticized the La Maschera Teutonica di Tafuri, Tafuri's Teutonic mask, i.e. mostly the use of Adorno and Benjamin. So that's an interesting aspect. OK, I'm trying to, to wrap it up. Uh, another thread is uh, architectural practice, Zevi. Zevi Architetto, Zevi active in many ways, uh, uh, building uh, palazzine, apartment houses in Rome uh, with various ki kind of partners, uh, designing an urban plan for Montagnana um, uh, in, uh, uh, where is it? It's in, uh, um, in, in Veneto, uh, working on the central station in Naples, building, and this is for me the own forgive me to be candid, the only really interesting project in all this uh, uh, cycle, building this little uh, Wrightian library in Doliani, uh, in Piemonte, uh, paid by the publisher Giulio Ainaudi uh, in memory of his father, who had been the president of the Italian Republic, the first one. So uh, very interesting writing project, which we could discuss uh, more. And finally, the uh, rather nutty, the pavilion of Italy in Montreal, and the rather nutty Asse Attrezzato, mentioned by people this morning. Um, in the fabric 
of Davis' discourse. There are still many hidden images to be found in the carpet. The most puzzling one is, for me, uh, is Judaism, an issue I've always been scared of dealing with directly myself in my own writing. Uh, and this would be another lecture. He, Davy publishes a book which is in general ignored in 1993 called Hebraismo in Architectura. It has been uh, republished recently with, a, uh, I think, a very careful and, and clever uh, forward by Manuel Orazzi. Um, and it's a discussion, it's a, a compendium of Davy's writings about Jews and about Jewishness. Um, it must be said that, that the Jews were, uh, very briefly, a very small minority in Italy. There were more or less, less than 50,000 Jews in 1939. And ma several thousand, very old population in Rome. It was a local population, almost no uh, immigration from the rest of Europe. Um, Zevi was part of one of the upper bourgeois family uh, in Rome, as well as his wife, Tulia Calabi, who would become the president of the uh, Jewish communities of Italy. So very present. At the same time, very uh, Zevi had interiorized the um, uh, statement by his uh, guru, Benedetto Croce, who was not an anti-Semite, but who had um, affirmed that the Jews uh, had to integrate to be uh, assimilated into the national fabric of Italy. So it was not, uh, it was deeply, as we've seen, part of Italian culture and politics, at the same time, a man of certain rituals, of certain tradition, very loyal to, to Israel, and very uh, open to the work of, um, to the work of Jewish architects. So for instance, the role Mendelssohn takes for me uh, has to do with his Jewishness and also uh, with, to a certain degree, with his architecture. And here, uh, maybe the first important consideration about uh, uh, um, Judaism and architecture is what Xavier writes about uh, Mendelssohn. I really love this photograph, which is uh, most unknown of uh, Mendelssohn, Wright, and Neutra with his extraordinary sandals, uh, uh, which replicates another photo of Wright, Mendelssohn, and Neutra in uh, Taliesin East in 1924 during the first journey of uh, Mendelssohn to America. Uh, what uh, Davy says uh, in one of his uh, most uh, important texts about this question of Judaism, it's a text called Hebraismo e Concezione Spazio Temporale dell'Arte, Judaism and space, Spatial Temporal Conception or Space Time Conception of Art. He uh, writes, uh, we should not be, uh, forgive me, I'm translating uh, of the curve from Italian. Uh, we will not be surprised if if uh, the Judaism is, is uh, in art has manifested itself essentially uh, in uh, the line of expressionism. Expressionism was the, the only movement uh, ready to demolish uh, all the aesthetic t and linguistic taboos without uh, building up new ones immediately. The only mo movement cap capable of Azzerare in Italian, bringing to zero, bringing to zero, uh, uh, capable of uh, developing an operation in apparently negative or um, destructive, but in reality only demolishing idols and golden cults. Uh, the unique movement which has had the courage of destructuring without restructuring of uh, temporalizzare, of temporalizing uh, not, not, uh, with, not with the goal of achieving an alternative spatial vision, but uh, excluding uh, any alternative. So a really strong identification of Judaism and expressionism is the first position. Then uh, Zevi also supported initially the work of Neutra on the left. Uh, 
a Jewish architect born in uh, Sl Slovak, what is now Slovakia, and trained in London. And he got a scathing response by Wright, which I find totally hilarious. And I will translate it to you. It's a letter of Wright to Zevi, 1953. Asked to see about Neutra. Absolutely offended to be compared to Neutra. Asked to see what he wrote and the work he did soon after he left Taliesin, where he was employed by me as a draftsman for eight months after his arrival from Europe. His chief talent lies not like that of the unmoral cuckoo, the bird that lays its own eggs in another's nest, but he is an immoral bird trying to lay my eggs <laughs> in his own nest. <laughs> in short, instead of stealing the nest, stealing the eggs. <laughs> How does he operate? Wright was 80, um, uh, 84. How does he operate upon the colossal ignorance of everyone concerning architecture? So for me, it's a very strong uh, statement, at least revealing one another aspect of Zevi, which, which has not been mentioned, another thread, which is the thread of friendships and uh, human relationship, and, uh, an ability at uh, connecting with people, and especially people he, people he admi admired and probably people he flattered. Uh, so there were other, uh, in this uh, galaxy of Jewish architects, Tonorov was a, an important one. Tonorov, who uh, was, this is uh, forgotten, but had been one of the two uh, uh, editors of Le Corbusier's Oeuvre Complète in 1930, a very complex project which uh, was carried by him, uh, who had worked in Philadelphia, who had made projects for Russia, and who had been in partnership with Louis Kahn uh, from the 30s to, the, to 1945, and been very active in planning in Philadelphia. An interesting uh, designer who was close to the trade unions and died in a plane crash together with uh, Walter Rother. So uh, Stonorov was, he dedicated a full issue of L'Architettura to uh, Stonorov. Uh, uh, the Ecker among the younger people. Here we see a young Ecker in front of his uh, Ramot Pauline scheme, which is today a complete ruin. So it was another one he uh, celebrated. And um, uh, of course, Gary and, and Libeskin. So, what is the definition uh, Zevi gives? Two, three more quotes. Uh, of uh, Judaism uh, in, uh, in art. Uh, Judaism in art uh, is opposed to three conceptions. A, classicism, B, uh, enlightenment, three, analytical cubism. No al classicism because it's based on an a priori order. No at uh, the enlightenment because it propagates universal ideas which are absolute and uh, absolutistic, no al cubismo, uh, because it, it's, it, uh, it is ab abstract from the materials, because it decomposes, uh, superimposes, and, uh, and articulates forms with a process which is only in appearance dynamic. Judaism in art is, uh, on the contrary, based on the anti-classicism on the destructuration, on the expressionist destructuration of form. It's based on the rejection of ideological fetishes of the golden section and celebrates relativity. It fights against the authoritarian laws of beauty and uh, is in favor of uh, um, illegal practices and the irregularity of the truth. And for him, the main figures representing this attitude are Einstein, Freud, Schoenberg in music. Uh, we, uh, he discusses Schoenberg very much. And uh, in the literary field, Kafka uh, in painting Soutin and Mendelssohn in architecture. So uh, in particular, Zevi will be uh, completely seduced by the emergence of so-called deconstructivism, this other fiction proposed by MoMA at the end of the 1980s. And he will uh, 
see it as a sort of blessed phenomenon allowing for the final burial of what he considered as the postmodern rot. Uh, writing. Under the deconstructivist, there is not a single one who declares himself deconstructivist. Uh, uh, on the contrary, they all seem to be snubbing and re rejecting the term. We don't want a movement for the emancipation of space. Uh, the facts are emancipating it. They, they are not proclaiming new principles. They are uh, annihilating uh, the ones that exist. They uh, claim, and this is back to the previous discussion, they are claiming an uh, architectural scrittura, an architectural writing uh, at zero degree, which would operate in a white neutral zone under under the zone of power and superimposed at the zone, at the vernacular zone. An architecture which, we, which would be fluid, like the Yiddish language, impure and contaminated. So here we see many aspects in which Zevi is trying to construct homomorphisms between architecture, language, between architecture and language, uh, not only as uh, uh, in terms of writing, but language uh, almost as a, uh, as, as a more fundamental concept. Uh, and this is where, again, uh, figures like Mendelssohn's, uh, Mendelssohn come to the foreground. Mendelssohn, to whom he will dedicate this uh, extremely ambitious and monumental volume, almost another coffee table uh, without legs. Uh, I wanted to, uh, as a conclusion, or as an exit to this uh, long tunnel, Zevian tunnel, to give a word to our dear friend and colleague, Raphael Moneo. We w wanted very much, and Mozan did his best to invite him here, uh, because we knew he had a, had a very productive relationship with Davy, but he couldn't make it. And I wanted to conclude with uh, this um, text, which Moneo wrote for the new uh, edition of uh, Davy's book, uh, the title is in Latin, not in, uh, not in uh, Italian, so it's Architectura in Nuke, uh, Architecture in a Nutshell. Uh, Moneo had translated the book into Spanish in 1969, and here he records the impact of Zevi's history on his generation of Madrid architects, himself, Fuyaondo, and others. He sees in the book um, uh, Zevi in a state of purity, and I will quote this, uh, inter uh, his interpretation of a book which is overlooked in general and which was initially published, it should be, it should be made clear, in 58 as the entry in architecture in the Italian Encyclopedia Universale dell'Arte. I quote Moneo, you can read it in Italian. Zevi, uh, my translation, Zevi, intelligent, perceptive, alert, enthusiastic, subtle, with a feeling for the times, biting, well-informed, and who masters smoothly the sources, but always on the side of what he sees as the struggle of the rebels against the powerful. Zevi displays all the cards. Architecture is the art of space. The history of architecture should be a narrative about the way in which the architects have constantly tried by giving shape to structure to capture space. But the perception of space also presupposes experience, implies the vision of space as a sensorial phenomenon, as something that deals with people for whom the environment always has a determined meaning. Thus, space as the manifestation of a culture. End quote. As we see it here, Zevi must still, can still, first, it can be read, it must or it should be read today, if only because of his interpretive passion not detached from the buildings. In the fabric of our times, the threads he has woven still lead us somewhere. Thank you. So, uh, John, we just agreed to take some questions or, or comments. Yeah. I 
Mike. No, Mike. As Mike, a, Mike. As the witness Mike. of... Mike, Mike, Mike. As the witness of... Uh, thank you, Jean-Louis. It was the perfect... I, I, I feel even more guilty that I didn't spend more my energies to document the work of the architects. Because I think it, in, in our academic world, this is exactly what Zavi is. But if I, if I think of Zavi as an Italian architect, suffering what I was trying to picture quickly today, I think the other side, what most stays of Zevi is the, the choice of architects. So it's critical agency. So blame on me that I didn't show you more on this. Maybe we should have coordinated more. But I think this is very important. That on one side, you have this way he intricates with the history and the historiography of architecture. On the other side, there was this daily agency pushing people, sometimes making mistakes, mistakes that grow with time. Uh, but still, I think it, when we look back at the history of our architecture, all we've missed from the, from the 50s to the end of the 80s, uh, there is a lot to learn, a lot to discover, and a lot even, I mean, for, this is also for students who don't, were not at the PhD level, but students that are in architecture schools, uh, maybe we, we left a, a catalog in the library, they will discover architects that they were bringing an Italian, uh, very interesting, uh, the Italian architecture towards very interesting directions. Uh, we see in, the, in, in, in the, the architects we chose for the exhibitions, uh, architects have became extremely relevant for many other people in the world, but not for us. So it's, it's very interesting what we got lost by, 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 uh, because we erased Zevi for so many, for such a long time. We learned a lot about Zevi doing this work. And so I think it's, it's the, the other side, the, 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 the other side of this beautiful na uh, narrative that, that Jean-Louis put up today is to encourage the students, the young people, also to look at what he was proposing as architects, because there is a lot of interesting experience and a lot of kind of extremely free research, uh, architectural research in that legacy. Sorry, Jean-Louis. No, no, no not, not at all. Uh, no, I think that there are many threads to be continued. One of them is perhaps a digital version of the exhibition with some original drawings, which could be a realistic, uh, realistic program for a, a North American architect school of high cultural ambitions, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or uh, and and also one of the questions, which we are sort of sim seminar symposium, uh, is it meaningful to bring some text by Zevi to yeah. an Anglophone audience? If so, which ones? I think there are many g fantastic interpretations. We see yeah. that there is a, a, res a wide research field, little in, in, in the R Roman catalog, but a lot in di unpublished dissertations or half-published dissertations. So uh, maybe not uh, translating Davies' uh, old books is not so meaningful, but translating is more uh, uh, vibrant and sometimes unfair essays uh, can be fun. So. I think uh, maybe it's also time to bring a new package of uh, documents to the audiences. No, Jean-Louis, really, thank you very much, and really thanks to uh, to to everyone else. I do, I do. Um, think that uh, what uh, what people mentioned about, I mean, you were critical about, self-critical about the role of curation, but I do think that this concept of curation, which sometimes gets a, sort of, it becomes a, it gets a bad rap, but it also becomes a kind of cliche, everything is about curating and whatever. I do think that, that that's an important theme in a way about I mean, to discuss about the, the, the manner in which one interprets architecture and represents it, and the things that are remade as part of the project of curation. So uh, not just sort of representing things through traditional models and photographs, but really how to, to do So that seems like one issue. 
the other one, the other topic that I think seemed very, um, very uh, positive in the exhibition, even though there wasn't really any analytical, at least I didn't understand it during the short time, was really the, the role of communication, um, uh, whether it's Metron, which is very beautiful as a, as a magazine, and the difference between Metron and L'Architettura. I think this kind of differences are very exciting to kind of discuss just the format of the magazine, what it's doing, and, and so this means of communication. The other thing that I think would be very important is that in the exhibition you have the voice of, uh, of Bruno Zevi, and today we missed, in a way, the voice of Bruno Zevi because everyone is talking about his communication capacities, but actually to hear him uh, make this... One should have brought a tape, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, ha we have it, but I think the video of him, like, almost shouting these kinds of pronouncements is very... Uh, is very is very I mean it's it's very moving in some ways to kind of um, to sort of hear him uh, present architecture through magazines or the difference between the kind of books and things like that. So I think it's it's actually very interesting that the nuances of projects that exist in the work of Zevi, as you have as you have said, and and I think this this last uh, topic, which is very uh, you said it's problematic. I think the relationship at the end of his life to Judaism, maybe other people who were speaking earlier, they might have some thoughts. I think that's also kind of quite, there seems to be more, more there, you know, at the end. Anyway, so really fantastic. Just uh, thank you for, for developing these themes. I, I was just thinking, it's not just uh, curation, it's also the, the radio question is very interesting. I mean, if you read uh, and even listen to, as I did as a child, listen to Pevsner on the radio, uh, listen to Bannum on the radio, uh, you know, the third program in England was the program that my mother always used to turn off because she couldn't stand listening to these toffs talking about things she didn't understand. Um, but, you know, I did. And, you know, it was very, very important for a whole range of generation of, of, of young people who had nothing, no, no real access to books, but a lot of access to, to radio. So Mussolini could use the radio one way, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, someone like Zevi used it the other way. Pevsner used it in order to integrate himself into England, like uh, the English and this is English art was the first set of lectures he gave on the radio when he was liberated from uh, from uh, internment in England, and so and Bannum mm -hmm. used it in in a, another way completely. Uh, so that I think the radio programs uh, also be subject of another doctoral thesis. Oh yes, there has been some work. The work of our friend Joaquin Moreno, for instance, and and uh, and uh, everything which he research he has done on the Open University. No, in the case of Devi, I think what, what one, meet, one meets media, of course, various media, radio, television, uh, the uh, weekly popular press, the professional press, so all a wide range, but also, I think, a wide range of rhetorical postures, the, the address, the the discourse, the prophecy, uh, and I think that uh, uh, there is no wonder if he's interested in Bart. He's interested in Bart because he's interested in discourse, not only as an instrument, but discourse as a field of uh, of human activity. And I find this very uh, rather exceptional in a way. Uh, uh, Fukata Furi Bach Zevi is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Because, uh, very, very different, right? No, this is an interesting. Uh, your, your choice of philosopher. An interesting right. string quartet. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, Thank you, Shabri, for, as always, an incredibly illuminating presentation. But just to follow up on the Dean's prompt, you mentioned that. Um, Devi's self-figuration as a, a messianic figure. And I think that's interesting in as much as, and here I'm basing it on the work of uh, Leon Wieseltier, the kind of anti-messianic strain within Jewish thought, which is also a historical development. And with that is the commitment to justice on earth, justice in our time, in a sense, and not awaiting the Messiah. So in that respect, Zevi becomes a very compelling character with his absolute insistence on 
justice and this fight against uh, the, the, those who possess power. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jean-Louis. <laughs> you spoke about Zevi's relationship to Mendelssohn, which is um, something I found absolutely fascinating. And actually, Mendelssohn moves to Palestine. And he does so because he very much believes in the Zionist project. However, when he moves there, it's British Mandate Palestine. And by the time Israel is declared as a state, Mendelssohn is gone, and part of the reason why he's gone is because he's very disappointed in what uh, Israel is turning out to be. And um, one of the reasons why he's so disappointed is because the idea of Zionism that Mendelssohn subscribes to is that of Martin Buber, which is the idea of the Jews returning to the Middle East as the place where they're from. And on the other hand, what's actually happening uh, in the 30s in Israel is that the version, the definition of what being Jewish means uh, is not this one. It's the one by Theodor Herzl, which is the idea of Israel, of the Jewish state, not as belonging to the Middle East, but rather as a European enclave within the Middle East. So my question would be, where does Zevi stand within that idea, that sort of tension between Buber and Herzl and their um, architectural pendant. So the architecture of Buber is that of Mendelssohn. And Mendelssohn, when he gets to Palestine, is very inspired by the local architecture. He says that, for example, the Adasa Hospital is an homage, uh, a mayhem, to the Palestinian village. Whereas on the other side, the architecture of the people who support Herzl is arguing that it's a European architecture. They're all students of the Bauhaus, of Le Corbusier, and they say the Jews are European, yet they belong to Israel, so we're building German architecture. We're building French architecture. So where does Zevi stand in that tension between the two? And then you also, like, in relation to this question, you mentioned the fact that you want to be careful when you speak about what's Jewish and what's not, and like, how do we read the remains of being Jewish in uh, Zevi's writing, and I understand. And maybe one way to remedy to this sort of lack of comfort in speaking about what's Jewish or not would be to acknowledge the sort of different versions that there has been in the past of what it means to be Jewish and what Israel should be in that sense. Well, there are various plans of uh, uh, section here, sectional plans. Uh, I, I will start with, with, the, with the end. I mean, um, I've not mentioned all the architects uh, uh, Zevi mentions in his collection of Jewish architects because, for instance, what does he do with uh, Khan? Khan is uh, really very engaged, builds synagogues, uh, not on a single one, uh, makes a fantastic project for a big one in Jerusalem, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't fit the canon. He's not, Khan is not a subversive. His architecture is nothing, no subversiveness. So, uh, and this is not uh, Zevi wants to, to wants to discuss when he includes Goldberg into the canon because he has built big towers in Chicago, what is the point? So I think it's really, uh, uh, his um, discourse is a slippery one sometimes. As to the difference between Buber, who by the way, wrote a little book on the architect, which is a very interesting little uh, sociological monograph. Um, I would put him on the side of, uh, definitely on the side of uh, Mendelssohn and Buber, and not on the side of the architects of Tel Aviv, among, among whom only a handful had been at the Bauhaus. Uh, no, and, and uh, there, no, there were, the architecture of Tel, of Tel Aviv is a sort of, uh, is very, very hybrid and diverse and comes a lot from architects who were, for instance, in Brno. So I, if I were to find the prototype of Tel Aviv, I would find it in the uh, Czech Siedlungen uh, of Brno or Prague, more than in uh, Pesach or in uh, Frankfurt.
So, I mean, you have to find that. And these are not the sources that the Israeli want to acknowledge. It's more prestigious to plant the flag of the Bauhaus of Le Corbusier. But in fact, they were uh, the number, uh, for instance, of Jews in the Technical University in Brno. Uh, in the interwar period, you had all the Romanians, many Hungarians, many Poles who were there. So one needs to look at things more carefully. But it's true that the, in terms of language, uh, they were closer to Le Corbusier. Or some Germans, the Lukart brothers, for instance, than um, in Berlin, than to, than to Mendelssohn. So uh, Zevi is definitely on the side of Mendelssohn. But one couldn't say that Mendelssohn's architecture, in particular in his later version, uh, has anything to do with other values that uh, Wright celebrates. Mendelssohn was not a subversive, except in the very, very short period of his uh, front sketches. And if he went to Palestine, I'm not sure that his motivations were idealistic. He just couldn't get work in strongly anti-Semitic and xenophobic Britain uh, of the second half of the 30s, where the very strong measures were taken to prevent the Jews from uh, the Jewish refugees from having a practice. So uh, you have to question these motivations. And also leaving for the US when uh, the construction boom had stopped because of the war was not uh, purely uh, was motivated by rather commercial reasons. So would, uh, uh, Mendelssohn was a very good businessman in his profession. So let me just thanks again. Thanks, everyone, for the course.